as Kristen mentioned, I'm currently at Nike. I'm a director in our global brand creative studio spaces, meaning I work on everything from branding projects to big campaigns to global kind of um, storytelling and content-driven elements throughout the entire Nike brand. So think broadcast, social media, um, app content, everything you can imagine within the Nike world is something that I'm really privileged and lucky to be able to influence, touch, and create for. In the span of my career, I think it's always really helpful to understand like what are the different things that you, someone does? How do they get there? Where are they going? So I'm gonna give you a little bit of that. For me, when I say I'm a creative director, it is a combination of all of these types of things and probably a lot more that I'm leaving off the page. But for me, it's really a combination of, of course, being rooted in a visual storytelling element. My background is in art direction and design, but I truly, really work across things from brand strategy to campaigns to web design to more general like storytelling and building frameworks that other people can build off of and jump into. And that is really kind of what feeds me creatively. I love connecting dots. I love pulling different people and pieces of work together and seeing what we can create that is brand new. In the scope of what I do, where I've been has been a really interesting journey. I have worked both agency side in New York, Portland, San Francisco. I freelanced all around the country, um, especially virtually during the pandemic. That was a really interesting and awesome opportunity to meet different people from all over the globe. And I've had a privilege of working on brands like this, um, from the Nikes and the Googles of the world, all the way to Outshine Bars, which is a frozen popsicle that you probably have in your refrigerator or freezer, to Stouffer's Lasagna, to Hot Pockets. I've really had an awesome some opportunity to be curious and to jump in to a lot of different categories. And I think one of the things that I love about the opportunity to work on brands like this is you find different elements of yourself in each one of those brands. And you find what gets you excited and you find you know, your purpose throughout all of these spaces. So I've been really, really lucky to work in these. Um, and as Kristen mentioned, I'm now at Nike and kind of bringing that curiosity and that imagination to everything I do there. This is a quick little preview of some of the work I've done over the past five years, just to give you a little small snippet um, at Nike within the past year and a half or so, I've had the opportunity to help launch our 50th anniversary campaign. So everything from the branding elements here, the deeper storytelling, that 50 word mark, the creative direction for all of our retail stores has been a really huge and massive project. This was not done alone, of course, this was done with a massive team, but being able to be kind of a core center point within that work was really challenging and really wonderful. That work was truly global and spread from every single corner um, of countries all around the world that you can imagine and was truly a collaborative effort. I've also been involved in the latest World Cup, so everything that you've seen around the Women's World Cup in Australia um, and New Zealand was really an awesome opportunity to make household names of some of our athletes that don't always get this love and attention that they should. And so any work that you've seen around that are also elements that I've been involved in. Beyond Nike, I've worked and been embedded at Google and really worked through a lot of the Olympic campaigns for Rio back in 2016, making content on the fly and really doing storytelling for what was happening in the moment of the games. I've also been involved in brands like MSNBC, something totally different than the world of sport um, that really is all about kind of branding and bringing forth a position for this platform, for this entity of who they are, what they do, and what they believe in for, with journalistic integrity and even worked on brands that are nonprofits and really spent a lot of time, love, and attention on working on different brands like One Love, which is all around teaching uh, young high schoolers how to have healthy relationships with one another, both romantic and platonic ones, which was a really awesome passion project that I got to dive into in one of my um, agency work streams a couple of years back. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of a smattering of what I do before I dive into what I'm really going to talk about today, um, which is how I got here and how I stay creative in my day to day. Those projects that you saw are all things that I do within my nine to five. Those are my like uh, billable hours, so to speak. Those are the clients that I work with, the agencies that I've been at. But that is just a fraction of what I do. I really look at kind of the whole of my creative self and how I bring a more robust version of my creativity all day, all the time, and what that looks like outside of my job is just as important as what it looks like inside of it. So just a little bit more on that. Um, how did I get here? As a little bit of a background, I went to University of Oregon. I graduated through the Journalism and Communications program. I actually initially thought I was gonna go into magazine. I was really into the marriage of art and copy and how those stories kind of uh, melded together to create something really beautiful and deep and editorial. 
At the time when I was in school, though, magazine was not the booming business. And so I realized that magazine was going to be a little bit static for me. It was going to have a template, a look that was already established. And I wanted something that was a little bit more active. And so I got the opportunity to really uh, jump into advertising and solve problems that were changing every single day with art and copy. So that was kind of really where my creativity was unlocked. And I really found an area and a focus that really helped me figure out where I wanted to apply my design skills. As you probably know very well, for those of you who are in college and the university program right now, sometimes college can feel a little bit like this, where you're just working all the time and you feel like you're doing these all-nighters and you're in the zone and you're finding all of this excitement and energy through your work. And that's definitely how college was for me, but that was exciting. It was really fun. I felt energized. I felt like there were so many opportunities and people I wanted to connect with. And so that really drove me and kind of uh, built my creativity up. After college, I moved to New York. I took a job um, at an agency there and really took a chance at like moving myself there in a way that was really spontaneous, but really fun and really rewarding. I got the chance to work at an agency called Code and Theory, where I worked on brands like Snapple, Dr. Pepper, 7-Up, and was a really fun space where I was like very hands-on making a lot of things at a high volume and a high consistency rate, which was really fun. I also learned a lot about what client needs were. That was my first time really kind of diving into what it looks like to match your creative ambition to a client's uh, needs and expectations. So it was a really good learning process for me uh, in terms of how you apply your creative vision to a real brief. After spending a couple years in New York, I moved back to the West Coast. I landed in Portland, Oregon, and worked at a couple different agencies here around town, from Swift to Analog Folk to a big freelance career across many different uh, verticals and spaces. I worked on brands like Nike for the first time and Adidas. I also worked at Oculus doing AR and VR storytelling around all of the different kind of multiple dimensions that you can explore and live in when you kind of work in Oculus spaces. So here's a goofy video of me playing a game for the first time. Uh, in this period of time, I was really, really hyped on a lot of the work I was doing. I was busy, I was energetic, I was always onto the next project. I loved the teams that I was worked with. I had all of this like creative ambition that was really kind of uh, building up inside of me as I was going through this phase of my career. And as Kristen and I were talking about what to really dig into as a topic today, one of the things I thought about is how did I create keep myself creative during this particular time of my life. I was so focused on all of these things at work. I was really getting after the next thing. How did I keep myself creatively engaged? How did I make sure that outside of nine to five, I was harmonious and well and filling my creative cup? And so those are some of the projects that I actually want to share with you all today. All right, so with that, staying creative outside of your nine to five for me has always been really important. The job is awesome. It's really wonderful when your passions and your day-to-day -day really line up and, and have this wonderful marriage of things you're interested in and things you actually get to make. But that doesn't always be the case. It's not always the case, and that's okay. And I think one of the things that I learned as I kind of had this journey back to Portland after New York is that I was really craving a creative community that helped me stay creative in multiple different ways that perhaps the day-to-day -day job wasn't always going to fulfill. So the first thing that I did when I landed um, in Portland was I was hungry for that creative community. And I searched around, honestly, online. And it was like, what are the different creative elements within Portland? What are people doing here? What's the exciting spaces to be in? And I found this thing called Suitcase Laundry, which doesn't exist anymore. But at the time, it was a collective of photographers, models, stylists, hair and makeup artists, art directors, who worked together perhaps day to day on production shoots for clients, but realized that they had a creative hunger and an energy to make something that didn't always aligned to a client brief. So Suitcase Laundry ended up becoming a collective of creatives who once a month or every other month would meet and really just kind of uh, bring out ideas for really fun photo shoots that we didn't get to do for client projects. These were people from all over Portland. It was not just one agency or one space. So you got to meet a lot of new people. I signed up for it one month and got assigned to a totally new group that I'd never met before, a photographer, two hair and makeup stylists, a wardrobe stylist, and a couple models. And the idea here was that you concepted around something that you wanted to shoot. The organization gave us a location that was free for the day, and we would go and make something. And the goal is that we weren't trying to sell it to a client. We weren't trying to make it to a brief. It didn't have a budget. It was all things that we could bring from home or things that we could kind of be resourceful about to build our own portfolios and kind of flex ourselves creatively. So our team was really inspired by Frida Kahlo, and we had this idea of like really kind of channeling that androgynousness that she brought into her space and into her work and how we kind of would modernize that in a fun way. 
So these are just some examples of some of the simple stills. It was not an overly complicated project, but we had a really wonderful, strong bond and connection, and I actually ended up working with this stylist later on in my career because of the community and the space that we built. So this was a really, really simple project. Again, it didn't have a timeline or a deliverable other than you have a location that's free that you can go and use on this date, work together and make something wonderful. And that was really, really inspiring to be free from a client brief or from kind of expectations of an organization just to make something that felt very free and very open. And what I did with that in return is I actually brought this work back to my agency at the time and shared it with my creative team and just kind of did an inspiration share like, hey, here's what we did and we were really excited and I got to learn this. And at the time I was really working heavily in like the food space. So I was doing a lot of work with Stouffer's and Outshine and I was doing a lot of styling of food but not a lot of styling of people. So this was kind of a fun muscle that I got to flex outside of work. And what that led to, I didn't expect. So in that share, there was someone in my creative team space that I didn't really get to work with that much. And she kind of hit me up on the, uh, hit me up on the side after that presentation and said, hey, I've actually been wanting to open a chapter of a nonprofit that I used to work with when I was in Denver. Are you interested? And as she told me about it a little bit more, I was like, actually, yes, that sounds awesome. And the opportunity was to open up a chapter of P Inc., otherwise known as Personal Inc. in Portland. P Inc. is a nonprofit that is um, a national nonprofit in the Americas, and it is really all about kind of matching up tattoo artists with breast cancer survivors who want to reclaim their mastectomy stars in a really powerful and visual way. And so that was really pairing up these tattoo artists with these survivors and giving them a free service to be able to reclaim their body in a way that felt really personal, strong, and driven towards what they wanted to show up as in the world, who they wanted to show up as in the world. So we gathered together a couple other friends. We tapped in and said, hey, how can we do this? How can we raise money? Let's find the right tattoo parlor here in Portland. Who wants to get involved? How do we fundraise for this and make sure we kind of support these women on their journey to recovery in a way that is really creative and really fun and powerful? And so we made a social media account. We made flyers. We tapped different um, tattoo parlors and really kind of got connected in the end with New Rose Tattoo, which is still here today. And they're a really awesome group of artists. And they decided to dedicate a whole day's worth of work and labor and talent to six really amazing survivors that we had identified from kind of a national list that was on a waiting list for this kind of service. So we were able to really pull that all together. And my role was kind of creating our visual look and feel. How are we going to you know, every little touch point, how are we gonna make that meaningful for the people who are involved? What's the welcome letter to the participant? What is our social media channel looking like to get those fundraiser dollars? What is the experience like when they arrive? And that was a really fun space to flex creatively and really use my creativity for a purpose other than, you know, a product or a service from a brand, but really for a community of people who needed something different than I had ever experienced myself. We also had a photographer there that really captured some amazing imagery. Um, and really kind of created lookbooks for each one of our participants to be able to take home with them afterwards. You can see here on the left-hand side is someone with their kind of stencil drawn on, and then on the right, after hours and hours in the chair, getting their final um, piece that was really personal and really creative for them. So being able to facilitate that partnership between the tattoo artist and the participant was really something so special. And to capture this moment for them on camera and be able to develop it and share it with them later has really meant the world to me and actually been a reoccurring um, opportunity that we did for about three years after this. So it kind of became this creative community that grew and tapped, I tapped into over time. No matter what was going on in my nine to five, I was always able to have this community to connect with, to reach out to, to meet new photographers, and to find purpose together in what we did creatively. Um, we also did a lot of fun stuff where I tapped some friends for illustrations and designs to help make that experience really fun. So again, it's just kind of this idea of these moments can become community moments where you tap other people to bring in and to really help expand the world that you're building for the community that you're serving. The next project that I wanted to share with you all is this idea of per my last email. And in a very similar space as that last one, it really started with a random kind of tap on the shoulder from a friend. Um, this happened through a text message chain where my friend and I were chatting and kind of uh, we were venting about work and how casting sucks. Like casting for a project is really hard when you work in the design and advertising world because you have to be really specific about who you want, what they look like, how tall are they, how fast should they be running through a scene. And you're getting very specific about someone's 
physicality in a way that is really tricky and the industry had not evolved the way they talked about casting in a long time. That vent session turned into a conversation about why is our industry not more open to talking about this kind of change and this kind of topic in the space. This was seven or eight years ago when no one was really talking about kind of the um, emotional labor and diverse CD, the scarceness of diversity in some of our casting projects. And that conversation really bred us into a space of like, let's have conversations about this out in the open. So my friend tapped her friend and we created a podcast series. Now, I wasn't ready to be the host of a podcast. I was not ready to have my voice out there in that way, but I really wanted to support the idea of kind of creating this emotional debrief for the advertising space where creatives could talk about all these different issues that they were addressing, whether it was how do you bring your full creative self in? How do you talk about different cultural nuances within the work? How do we talk about casting in a more effective and more um, representative way? And so we created a five episode podcast series that really dove into this. And the brief that my friends and I gave ourselves was we wanted to make something that felt um, a little bit ugly, actually, <laughs> was our brief. All three of us were working on different brands that were very modular, that all had very specific creative guidelines set in place. And it was all about upholding the excellence of those existing guidelines. And there wasn't a lot of space for us to be silly or irreverent or even make some things that felt like they were making and breaking grids. And so we thought about, you know, let's bring in together all of these different elements that we are kind of rebelling against. Let's bring out all of these pieces that we don't get to do in our everyday work life and make that the identity of this podcast as we talk about these subjects that are also about rebelling against the typical um, work protocol and New York advertising life at the time. So we created a little bit of a brand per my last email. We leveraged you know, different fun creatives and toolkit elements. We made little like avatars for our podcast. It was super simple. It was not this like deep, crazy thing, but it fed us and it fed us creatively. It helped us find an identity. It was a super fun, fun place to play in. We had a whole website. We made all of these things. We had guest speakers come on and it was just a playground, to be honest. It was a playground to try new things, to do things that we weren't able to do in work. We were all bored with some of the things we were doing in work. So this became a really fun place to test out new ways of working together, new ways of creating design elements that I wasn't getting to do in my workspace. We even kind of made a really bonkers website that made no sense when I look back at it. But at the time, it was really fun. And it was a way just to kind of um, create lots of weird, like little giffy moments that you could tap into and click into. And we made collages based on the theme of each of our episodes. So one was about casting. Another was about mentorship. Another one was about immigrant mindsets because we all had parents from an immigrant background and kind of bringing that into the workspace in a really fresh and interesting way. Um, before I move on to this next one, I think something that's really cool out of that project, while it was only just a three or, or five episode little series and it didn't go anywhere after that, it was a really fun opportunity to find ourselves creatively again in work that we didn't get to do day to day, but that we got to do with each other. And I think one of the coolest things about that is Isadora Torres was one of our podcast hosts. And again, this was six or seven years ago. Since then, she's actually published a book on the topic of bringing your full self to the workplace. She is now a sought after expert and consultant in this space. She works in New York and she is so amazing and has really, she found herself in that project and was able to pursue and kind of change the course of her career to move out of being just a strategist in an advertising space and is now someone who really advocates for diversity in the workplace, what that means and tactical elements to bring emotion into a workplace that perhaps wasn't welcome before. All right, this last project I'm gonna bring us to through is called New York Calling. Um, and you'll see a theme here, friends of friends of friends really made this project happen. This one was actually one of the same people from the podcast. At the beginning of the pandemic, we were all feeling, of course, very low, very isolated. We didn't know what we could do to help and we were feeling very confused about what was going on. One day though, I got a text from her and she was like, hey, through some connections that I have, I've been hearing from medical professionals in New York that they just are completely devoid of true PPE product. They do not have the protection that they need to be able to do their jobs and I wanna do something about it. Can you help? I had no idea what I was gonna do. I had no idea what I could contribute, but I said yes. Um, turns out she had some friends in the fashion and product building spaces who actually had this whole idea to use their 3D printers to create custom PPE kind of um, uh, headwear pieces that they could print right in their own home. 
And so it started with an Instagram post where they posted this on their Instagram story saying, hey, if you have this kind of machine, please hit us up. We're looking to actually make some PPE proactively for uh, medical professionals in our community in New York City. And so that's what they did. I learned so much by watching what they do, by learning about what it means to 3D print. I had never done that myself, truly. I didn't know the correct specifications or like, you know, the... Um, medical like standards that were needed and the types of plastic. But through this process, I truly played a support role and I learned what they needed, how they were gonna activate and their distribution model. And what I was asked to do then in return is to really create a branding system and a fundraising system that would allow us to fund them to do this project, to pay for the plastics, to pay for the energy and the transportation that was needed to deliver these PPE products between different facilities in New York. And so that's what I did. Um, after observing and kind of getting all of this info just through text, they are all in New York and I was in Portland, I really was able to kind of channel all of the energy and the excitement and the, um, the drive that this community and this team had. And we really pulled that together into a look and feel for a website and a social media campaign that was hopeful, that hopefully brought um, some excitement to action that one could take and brought some credibility to it. We were gonna be asking people for money. We wanted to make sure we showed up in a way that felt accountable to those dollars we were going to be um, you know, asking from people and that we were providing visibility into how their money was being used, where it was going, and exactly what kind of PPE we were making. Again, this was at a moment in early 2020 where there was not enough to go around and our medical professionals did not have what they needed to be safe and secure. So the visual look and feel that we made, this ended up being kind of a, um, a really strong standard that we set of how we had outreach to different fundraiser opportunities. We had yoga studios holding like, you know, virtual yoga placements uh, to actually like raise money for this. We had different random internet celebrities who jumped onto this and I'll show you one in a minute that like got excited and decided they were gonna do a promo for it. So it just kind of spread in a really natural and organic way. And I was super happy to play that support role and to be able to learn what these other people were brilliantly doing and support them through the communications and through the fundraising efforts that I could help provide. In the end, this project ended up being operational from three cities and two different continents. One of our founders was actually in Tunisia at the time. We had six printers in production at any given moment, give or take. We had five volunteers outside of our core kind of working team. We ended up raising $30,000, which was pretty incredible for the time span and the moment that we were in. We distributed over 30,000 units of 3D printed PPE, and for the additional funds that we got at the end that were this, was this large sum, we actually just ended up buying PPE that was then finally able to be in production and gave that directly to the hospitals. Um, we also ended up supporting over 22 healthcare facilities, including the Rikers healthcare facilities, different hospitals in Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Queens. And it was a really amazing project that like kind of took off in a way that I didn't expect. And again, this was all outside of my nine to five and something that just continuously got me excited and wanting to kind of continue to pursue to learn in this space. This is the random act of bizarre kindness I was mentioning. If you don't know who this is, this is Wayne Diamond. He is from Uncut Gems. He randomly got connected to our project because his granddaughter was born during COVID. And his grand, he was very worried about his granddaughter, this newborn baby. And one of our PPE designers actually created a custom molded uh, little PPE shield for a newborn. And it was one of the first of its kind. We called it the diamond shield in honor of the family name. And we actually ended up um, putting that out into the world as a free source. So it was like a free design file that anyone could pick up and use in print. The story ended up traveling and we got covered in Vogue and in the New York Times. That was not the goal, but it was really just truly uh, an example of the power of this team and the power of purpose, driving our creativity into a place that really meant something to a lot of people. All right, I know I just walked through a lot. I know I can talk a little fast. So this is a moment to breathe. And think about how I'm gonna wrap this up. I will be honest with you all, I was talking with my team before I came here today. And I was like, man, is this room gonna say, Gabrielle is coming here to talk about how you keep your creative cup filled outside your nine to five. And she just walked us through four different projects and tasks and timelines and assets that she had to do. And maybe it will feel that way for some of you, but when I look at these images and talk about these stories, for me, what I see are topics I'm deeply interested in people I love connecting with, and an entrepreneurial spirit in myself that is really cool to recognize when I look back in time. Those things creatively feed me. Those things keep me balanced. 
I'm not doing this every single week, you know, every single month of the year. These ebb and flow with my life over the course of the career, and they're always in harmony with what I'm doing within my nine to five. Sometimes your job will fulfill you and will be everything that you want and everything that you were hoping to create when you were in school, and sometimes it won't, and that's okay because what you can do outside of that time will re-energize you and create this kind of infinite circle of creativity, and I truly believe that, and I see those opportunities in these projects as spaces that fed my, my creative soul. So as I wrap it up, I will leave you with this last silly little visual of the vampire test. All of these projects, for me, personally, pass the vampire test. And simply put, the vampire test is what you see on the screen. Whatever excites you, go do it. And whatever drains you, stop doing it. It really can be that simple. Uh, if you surround yourself with topics and people and a community that you love, and you can go back to time and time again, you will create a world where you are constantly being inspired, you are constantly able to show up as your best self, and you're constantly in harmony with your entire being, inside of work and outside of work. And so with that, I'm so excited to hear any questions you have for me, and thank you so much for giving me the time and space. All right. Do we just do questions from here, Kristen, or how do you want to... No problem. Maybe you That's a great question. Thanks. Thank you, Silver. Um, so just repeat the question. It is, is there a difference between working on the West Coast and East Coast and all of the elements that come with that collaboration, creativity, communication? I would, in short, say yes. Um, I personally really loved and thrived when I worked in New York. It is a fast-paced culture. It is a quick-talking space. It is also high expectations of volume of what you produce. I always joke that a year in New York is a year and a half, if not two, anywhere else. The amount that you make, the speed at which you move, uh, and the decisiveness that you have are all really interconnected. And a lot of that has to do with how direct people are. If you go to New York, they're going to tell you, I don't like that. Here's why, and here's what we're going to do next. I have experienced personally, at least, in West Coast um, working cultures, they might be like, I'm not sure I love it, and... I'm thinking it could maybe be a little bit more like this. There's, there's a little bit of a nicety around things, which can be really wonderful, but you don't move as quickly sometimes. It's not as direct. I personally uh, like the New York vibe and will one day uh, go back there, I hope. But I do think there's a difference. Um, not, one's not better than the other. It's kind of where you're at in your life and in your career. In New York, I definitely was working till 8 p.m. every night. And if I wasn't, someone was like, oh, wow, you got off early today. Like, that was just... And the expectation, um, I hope it's different there for folks now, but at the time that was just, that's what it was. And when I moved to Portland, people actually left work at five. And I was like, what do, what do you do with three extra hours of your day? <laughs> like I had all of this energy and excitement, which is where you saw me kind of pour myself into these other projects. Yeah. yeah thank you. Of course. And there are exceptions like um, there I does not say that I did have, don't have working late hours these days. I do, but I do think it's more consistently in the tone of an East Coast versus a West Coast in terms of how people talk to one another. 
It's been a while now. I've been back for about seven or eight years. No, I've been back. I've actually been back here longer, but I think I just cut my teeth in New York and I found myself there. Uh, technically, the other coast. Yeah. 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 Do you feel like there's a difference in terms of the creative communities that you experience also, or do you feel like they're uniquely? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. True. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's real. I think the hybrid culture has been really interesting too, merging coasts together. And like now I've worked with teams in Richmond, Virginia, where we have teams in Richmond, in New York in Portland and in Austin. And putting all of those different working spaces and lifestyles together is really, really interesting. Yeah, true. <laughs> Any other questions or thoughts? I have a question. Yeah. Ooh, that's a good question. Okay, the question is, are there major differences between corporate side and agency side? Yes. Um, I will say at an agency side, at least for me, I feel like I had a really wonderful ability to go wide at a lot of different spaces and a lot of different um, like areas of interest, from food to tech to sport to news. Like you can really span all of that in a lot of in a very short time. You get a lot of exposure to different kinds of industries. And for a curi curious person like myself, like I love to ask questions and I love to bounce around things. So I think that is really exciting and I do miss that sometimes. When you're corporate, it's more about going deep. It's more about really focusing in on one thing or one area of expertise and like owning that from top to bottom in a really deep and meaningful way and trying to shift culture because you know that thing so deeply. So I think it can be a little bit more... Um, it's, it can feel a little bit like boulder up a hill sometimes because it feels slower. Those are the differences, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think I saw it as an Instagram post because a coworker had participated in it. And so they had posted some images that they had done and they tagged suitcase laundry. And I was like, what's that? And so I did the Instagram like dive of like, where is this? What does it look like? And all it existed as was an Instagram account with like a, you know, here's an email if you want to be involved. And that was it. And I didn't know that coworker enough to ask them, although I probably should have. Um, but what I was able to find out through asking through it is that it was truly uh, started, I believe, by a couple of producers who just acknowledge all of these like creative ideas and energies that there were around them and the fact that like they didn't need to wait for a creative brief to do something. And so they really initiated the program. They tapped some of their photographer friends and their art director friends and started the first one. And it really kind of grew organically. So I basically filled out a Google form. I said, here's my name. Here's my areas of expertise. They had a couple of topics that you could be interested in, like what kind of editorial are you looking to do? Is it more fashion? Do you want something more conceptual, something more still life? And so they kind of would pair you on teams based on your interests. Um, and then also on your availability. So you kind of said, I want to meet on Mondays. And so you got generally put with people who had availabilities on a Monday. So they did a really good job of setting that up. Then there was an email intro, and it was mostly me and the photographer at first. So as the art director and photographer, we kind of led what is the core idea we want to get after. And then we briefed in the rest of our team to kind of workshop against that, make sure that there weren't any other ideas that we also wanted to go after. And it was probably about a three-week planning process, very casually, all over email, maybe one Zoom-like call. This was before Zoom culture was as prevalent as it is now. 
And then we all just showed up with clothes, makeup, gear, in big old suitcases at one location that the organizers had secured. And we all just took turns taking photos in different rooms of that house um, and found what was right for our concepts. And then there was a editing process that we reviewed together, and that was really it. So it was kind of a really nice contained thing, and you could do it multiple times a year. I think you could do it up to four times a year because they had enough people that they wanted to rotate through. I don't, but I think it could should be revived. I feel like it was such a fun thing. Like, let's look it up and see if they're doing anything. Anything else? Let's go. Uh, okay. So, um, can you talk about other like, difference in your opinions inside like, corporate? Um, my question is, how do you navigate conflict in the creative space when it comes to maybe conflicting ideas um, or, more specifically, who don't necessarily have like the creative background that you have, you know, have an idea about how something is supposed to go, how the process is supposed to go, or how something yeah. Yeah. But you would know differently. <laughs> like, what do you do in those situations? Great question. Okay, repeating it for the Zoom. Um, what do you do to mitigate conflict? or differences of opinion and how a process should run between your creative team and an agency or a, and I'll say even another stakeholder yeah, client team. Um, it's tough, I'll say that. One of the tricks I always do is if they're really stubborn on something, I'll give them what they want and then I'll give them what I think they should have. So I'll show you what it is exactly that you're asking. You want the logo 50% bigger and you want it centered and you want it to be over a giant picture of a jacket, okay, here's what that looks like. I'll do it, I'll make it nice. I'm not gonna like, you know, make it throw away. It's still gonna have some creative integrity to it. But then I'm gonna show you what you could have. And sometimes that is a little bit of extra work and I usually talk to my creative team about it and say, hey, we have to show them what they want at this point in time. This is where it's at. We all believe this other thing is better. Are we willing to put in a little extra time to make that? And more often than not, teams are and we show it I'm not saying it works every time, but I do think they see the difference when you have a client who can't envision what you're saying to have the space and time to show them is gonna be your biggest tool to be able to persuade them. I think another thing that has been really helpful is actually at the start of a project, setting up your team culture with your client and saying, hey, I'm gonna, like you're hiring us to be the experts and here's what we're gonna be the experts at and you outline your domain and what you're really going to bring for them and the excitement and the energy and like the expertise that you and your team have. And then I tell them, and I'm gonna look to you to be the expert on these things. And I say, I'm, you're gonna know the product inside and out. You're gonna know the contributors to how that product came to life. I'm gonna look for you for that. You're gonna know the strategy of your overarching brand better than I do. So I will trust you here and you have to trust me there. And if you have that at the beginning, I have used that throughout conflict later on where I'm like, hey, remember when we set that up before? You gotta trust me. You gotta like know that this is my area of expertise or this is my teammates area of expertise and like we gotta trust and respect those bases and sometimes that can work as well. <laughs> yeah. I think there's something really powerful about like holding space at the beginning of a project to do that. I was just talking with Kristen that I've been doing this kind of um, leadership training thing at Nike that they're doing which is cool and like actually been less uh, cheesy than I thought it was gonna be. Um, and one of the things that we've really been learning is like, especially at Nike, we're so quick to be like, here's the brief, go! And we're like making things and we're trying to solve it and we're already getting into fights about who's gonna do what, when, before we even take a minute and be like, have we agreed about how we wanna work together? How are this team gonna be set up? Whose responsibility is gonna be to usher which part of the project through? And I think holding that space at the beginning, even when we're so eager and excited to get started, has been critical to the success of a project at the end.
Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. Okay, so how do you navigate confrontation or differences between yourself as a creative entity and other creatives in the community, potentially even outside of a professional setting? So actually going back to that suitcase laundry example, I showed you one image set from that. There were two. There was a th second one that I didn't love that much. It was like a bubblegum pink theme, which was very poppy and fun, and the photographer really wanted to go for it, and I was not into that idea. I didn't feel like it had more story or depth for me at the time, or I'd seen it before. But this was my partner. This was someone I was like literally going to work with, and sh we had to have a conversation about why do you want to do this? Like, what is it about this that you're so excited about? So I can get on board or I can help you achieve it. And she ended up telling me that she had really wanted to move into more like mainstream work. She had been doing a lot of like, um, she had a niche in like fairies, which is very interesting. She liked to do a lot of fairy photography and a lot of like Renaissance photography, like for Renaissance fairs and stuff. And she wanted to move into like a very poppy mainstream space. And this is how she thought she was going to get after that. And so I was like, all right, I'm still not fully sold on this as the vision, but I will help you unlock and I will move out of the way so that you can get what you need and I'll support you in this. And we will also like do this other one, which are, where's, where, like, I'll drive this and you drive the other one and we'll have a partnership. And that ended up working for us. In the editing process, it wasn't easy because her edits were like not, uh, the color correction and the tone on it was not something that I loved. But what I did is we created very clear boundaries of like what work was doing what job. And that's a project we were working together on, so it's a little bit different than your question, but you kind of end up selecting like what works for you and elevating that and holding that close to your brand and saying what were you doing for somebody else or how are you creating space for somebody else. And I think there's a lot of like integrity in that. And there's a lot of creative respect when you make room, whether it's someone on your direct team or someone out in the creative world, where you're like, this isn't for me. We've talked about it and we've had an honest conversation, but I'm going to clear a lane for you because I want you to do that for me one day when you don't like something that I'm doing. So it's kind of about like that reciprocity of, of creating space for other people, even if you don't agree with it. If that fully answers your question, but that's what comes to mind. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you. Guys. Thank you.